given the weather that we've had this weekend, I want to start by telling a story about a sled. Susan was a mother whose kids came to her asking for a faster sled. They wanted a sled that was faster than the neighbor's sleds, something many of us parents can relate to. But instead of saying no, or you know, we'll buy one, or let's wait a while, she sat her children down and talked about how sleds are made. It turns out that Susan had been best in her class at maths and sciences, and had spent a lot of time in her father's shop helping out as a child. So she was the person in the family who fixed things and made things. And so she sat down her sons and talked to them about things like drag and wind resistance and materials. And it's not surprising that her sons became makers. They had a little company selling toys to neighbor kids. They made kites and they sold those. As teenagers, they built a letterpress, they built a lathe. And I like to think that some of the lessons that they learned at the table about designing a sled came in handy when they made their own transportation device later in their lives. Right? You may have recognized these brothers as Orville and Wilbur Wright. So as a mother and as an engineering professor, I spend a lot of time thinking about how are makers made. There's a lot of challenges in the world that we need solved, and we need creative answers that usually involve tangible physical solutions. How do the people who are great innovators and engineers, both today and in the past, how did they get there? Did they do things as kids that helped that path? And I've read lots of histories, but I became so fascinated with this that I've been doing interviews with makers of all sorts, famous engineers and people that you may not have heard of who are doing amazing work. And there's some very common, common stories that I hear in each of these interviews, and I want to share four uh, brief stories with you that show you some of these, these common themes. First is Bradley Gothrop, and Bradley is a or pipe organ designer and builder. And pipe organs are a marvel of design. Right? There's fluid mechanics, there's electronics, there's materials, there's manufacturing. There's even just moving all those big parts around. And Bradley didn't go to college for this, and he didn't wait till he was an adult to learn about pipe organs. He was homeschooled, and his parents were very encouraging of roaming the neighborhood and finding parts and apprenticing. And he had his first job at 16, and he learned to build all these things. And he speaks about how supportive his parents are that they let them do things kind of freely. And he told me, you know, it's amazing what four kids working in shifts with a real shovel can do. His parents hadn't authorized that project, and they undid it. But the impact they had in their backyard was really powerful to a bunch of small children. Similarly, Lenore Edmond went on to co-found Evil Mad Science, where she creates open source technology projects, like this table that as she moves her hand over it, it reacts. They publish all the designs for them and the information freely on the web for people to build, but also sell kits and, and materials so others can learn how to make things. Well, Lenore also grew up in a family where she was always building things, like this three-story high treehouse that she built with her dad out of found materials. And I was really fascinated by this, and I said, Lenore, when did you start to use real tools? When were you trusted with real tools? And she couldn't answer. She couldn't figure out a time when she didn't use them. Because her dad always left a block of wood and a bucket of nails and a hammer out, and anyone who needed to could start hammering away at nails. And she was pretty sure her brother was two when he was doing that, that it was always trusted. You learned how to do it properly, and that was OK. Well, similarly, Steve Hofer, who also contributes lots of projects that others can learn and build from freely. Um, one I love is this one in the bottom, Tacit. This is a force feedback, haptic feedback device for, for the visually impaired that puts pressure on your wrist so you can know how far away you are from an object. Well, Steve, who helps solve problems for lots of companies and individuals, he grew up on a farm. And not only do you have freedom and real tools on a farm, you're expected to pull your weight. Even the smallest kid can help on a farm and has to, to make things work for the family. And tools, well, there's always tools lying around, and if you see a wrench and you see a bolt, you start turning it. It's just expected. You're, you're part of the family. You're contributing. So the last story along these lines is Rocky Velas. And Rocky is a roboticist. Not only is she a roboticist, she's a roboticist who also teaches kids about robotics and is an a entrepreneur as well. And she told me the story about coming home one day from school and her mother being very concerned because her pockets were completely full of screws. And her mom said, you're bringing them back to school tomorrow, and she did. And the teachers were very relieved. Because that evening, it turned out that the air conditioners were missing all their screws. And I said, Rocky, how did you get a screwdriver? And she said, yeah, it was preschool, so they didn't give me a screwdriver. But you don't need a screwdriver in preschool, you can make your own. That resourcefulness shows up in all the stories, that you can make your own. And I wondered what today's youth were like. Is this the same? And in 2009, I read this study by the Nuts, Bolts, and Thingamajigs Foundation. And when they polled US teenagers, they found that 83% of them spent less than two hours a week doing hands-on work. In fact, they found that 27% spent zero time per week working with their hands. And the same year, conveniently, another study came out 
and the Kaiser Family Foundation that found that 8 to 18-year-olds spend 53-plus hours per week on entertainment media. And this is just a comparison of the, the amount of time, and there's a lot that can be learned through these different media, mostly digital media, in those 53 hours. But an interesting observation I've found is that it's starting to be easier to find a cooking video game than it is to find a school that still teaches home ec. And I still eat real food, and this worries me, and I wonder where are we going to be learning these real skills? Right, you wouldn't wait until a student got to conservatory to give them their first real piano. But are we doing that with our future makers? Well, in Minnesota, we have many makers, and we have many schools that are teaching making skills, and I've been emailing and speaking to on the phone professors around the country, particularly engineering, because that's what I teach, and asking what they've seen in terms of hands-on skills. And across the board, what I'm hearing is engineering professors are seeing students coming in, and they all say that students seem brighter and more aware of the world than they've ever been, and better communication skills. But pretty much across the board, the hands-on skills have been declining, pretty rapidly and pretty extremely. There's always the outliers, and there's students who are still building their car in their garage, but more and more students are coming in not having worked with their hands. In fact, one professor said that he asked his incoming class of engineers, 35 of them, how many had taken apart at least one toy as a kid. And the answer? Not a single hand went up in this room of engineers. This is a beautiful machine shop. This is at South High School in Minneapolis. And it's stunning. You can still learn how to do a lot of hands-on things in here, and real machines and real tools and teachers who are trained in this. Unfortunately, this is the last machine shop in the Minneapolis School District, okay, the last place where we are taught teaching machining. And what does that mean for us? Well, one nice thing is that more and more we're seeing our schools adopting rapid fabrication. This is a 3D printer that we're seeing in many schools, elementary schools even around the country, um, where students can take ideas and have them come out in 3D. But I want you to look closely at printers like this and other devices that you may see. Notice that we do still put these together with screwdrivers. Right? The basic hand skills and the basic understanding of manufacturing and what things are made of are still important. As Dr. William Guilford at the University of Virginia said to me, how are you going to design something if you've never built anything? Right? He teaches engineers, and you have to build something, you have to design something. Well, I'd go one step further and say, how are you going to build something if you've never taken apart anything. And it's easy to start, right? I'm guessing most of us would agree that William Shakespeare probably didn't come out of the womb speaking Romeo and Juliet. Somewhere along the way, he read the words of others, right? He got to see how other authors put together words and told stories. And interestingly, almost every maker that I've met, spoken to has mentioned that they were an avid reader. But we have to remember that for makers and engineers and innovators, these are also our books, right? This is how we see how the parts fit together, how other people before us have made things. And this is an important part of becoming an adult maker. So perhaps it's time that we have the one screwdriver per child movement, where we take it upon ourselves to make sure that every child out there knows how their physical world is put together. And yes, that usually means taking things apart, and usually, if it's the first one you've done, it doesn't come back together, or at least not the way it was originally intended. But this is incredibly important. And I suspect that there's a lot of you in the audience who are smiling right now and saying, it's okay, I gave my kid Legos. And I love Legos, and my daughters have lots of them. But there's an important thing about Legos that isn't always true in many of the big projects that we do later on, which is that the pieces always fit together. And in many of the big engineering projects and making projects that are undertaken, there isn't the magic red brick that snaps in and completes the whole thing. One thing I heard over and over as I spoke to people is one of the things they gained from their making experience as child is the empowerment to know that just because they couldn't buy the exact part they wanted, it didn't mean that they couldn't have that part. Right? They just had to find a way to innovate it themselves. In the 1960s, this book came out. It's the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, and it's geared for youth. And the front page does have a note to, to usually parents, but to adult mentors. It says, this isn't a toy, and you should supervise youth who are using it, and you'll probably learn something too. But then it goes on to do things like teach how to make chlorine gas. Right? And it tells about the dangers, and it's very careful about it. But the authors of this book and the publishers of this book trust that a child with the right mentor and the right supervision, and having read the instructions and having that supervision, can be trusted with this. There's a big difference when you today can buy chemistry sets like this one that on the box highlight the fact that you can do fun chemistry activities with no chemicals. 
And I'm an engineering professor and a mechanical to be specific, so I spend a lot of time with literally the nuts and bolts of the world. And I love this picture. This is a school in the early 1900s. It's the University of Chicago Laboratory School. And this is a group of students, no older than 14, many quite younger, who are building a two-story playhouse that they designed themselves using things that they learned in school, the trigonometry and the materials. They even laid the cement foundation and I heard got the building permits. Right? Notice that there's none of the five and six-year-olds up there, but they were in their own classrooms making small furniture and dollhouses with real tools. Contrast that now, we can buy a set that's for kids six and up that says it's real construction, but has neither real wood nor real tools. What are we waiting for? Are we waiting to give that piano until we're in college? When are we going to let kids actually learn how to build real things with their hands? And here's my confession. This is my daughter, and yes, those are plastic tools. But she's 13 months old in this picture. And she has moved on to real materials and real making experiences with me as she's gotten older. I love this picture. If I show this to someone in Europe, they might recognize it as what it is, which is an adventure playground where kids can go and build, right? And there's supervision and there's tools and they can actually build real structures. And it doesn't seem like a stretch to me to say that someone who has this experience as a kid is much more likely to at least know it's a possibility when they're older. If you've never experienced something or been exposed to it, how could you know that's a possibility? I worry a little bit that in some audiences that I show you this, the first thing you think isn't playground, but lawsuit waiting to happen. So since many of you in the audience have brought your mentors with you, I want to end with a story about one of my mentors. And this is Paul McGill. And Paul, as he grew up, was an avid maker. He was the sort of kid who walked down the streets, and if he saw men on telephone poles, he asked them to throw down some copper wire so he could incorporate them into what he was building. And he said they often did. His mother used to take him regularly to the hardware store, and they'd walk down the aisles, and they weren't allowed to ask for help. Instead, they had to walk down every aisle and look at the parts and try to figure out which they needed, and they always got sidetracked and found other cool things and tried to guess what those were for, and they said they always left with more things than they went for. He once convinced an English teacher on the right that instead of a book report, he would build a working diorama of flickering lights of an Antarctic research station. Paul, like many of the other makers I speak to, said he was an avid reader, and he listed some of his favorite books as a kid, and he just happened to throw these ones out there, Contiki, Across the Pacific by Raft, and Alone in the Antarctic. And these are pretty fitting, because where I met Paul was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where Paul is an electrical engineer and builds cutting-edge research tools, like this remotely operated underwater robot, to look in the ocean for, for scientists, to find things that we've never known about. And I thought that was a great way to end this talk. And I emailed Paul and asked for permission to use this slide. And he said, what a great picture. You know the story, right? I said, yeah, it's an ROV. It's at, in the ocean, and there's the Antarctic in the back. And he said, yeah, but that's not the vehicle that we brought to the Antarctic. One of the first days in the Antarctic, the vehicle, the professional vehicle we had, got lost. Um, it went down under the ice and never was seen again. And so we were on this boat with all these scientists and 40 more days in the Antarctic, and we didn't have a robot anymore. So myself and these two other engineers, he said, makers all, we, in three days, scavenged for parts around the ship and built a remotely operated vehicle ourselves out of found parts that then worked for the next 40 days and got all the scientific data that they were intending to get. This was the little boy who walked down the street getting copper wires and taking things from construction sites when he was allowed and dreaming of the Antarctic. I hope that we're giving today's kids the skills and the tools, both literal and figurative, that they need to turn their dreams into reality, to turn their creative and sometimes crazy ideas into tangible physical things. Right? Because I hope that some of the challenges of today, the big challenges the world faces today and tomorrow, are going to be solved by someone today who is still a little kid. And we better hope that we're giving them the confidence and the knowledge to understand how their world works and also join a tradition of very creative makers. Thank you.